Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. Well, it's not a bird, and it's not a plane, it's a UFO, which just means we don't know what it is, it's unidentified, but it's up there. And Connecticut has had, actually, quite a few brushes with UFOs over its history. Our guest this week is Mike Panicello. He's state director of Connecticut MUFON, which is the Mutual UFO Network. They're the group that monitors all the UFO sightings across the country. Well, we're going to hear from him in just a moment. Now this week's trivia question. What important industry did Plymouth, Connecticut and Plymouth Hollow, Connecticut play host to during the state's early industrial development? We'll stick around after the main program. We'll have the answer to that question because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. Well, maybe you've seen one, a UFO, or maybe you've even been abducted by aliens. Some people claim they have. Well, it still sounds a little bit outside the norm, and those who say they've seen UFOs or had encounters with them are not always held yet in the highest esteem. But it's a lot better today for those individuals than it was in the recent past. And you can thank a new openness to this topic by the government and even in the halls of academia. It makes the topic overall less taboo. But you can especially thank, from 2017, an article in the New York Times. The Times investigated this little-noticed part of the Defense Department budget known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Well, essentially what the Times reported was that $100 million has been spent in this century to look for UFOs, but nobody in the general public was aware of it. The Times report, of course, then called for more releasing of information by the general public. And yes, during COVID, the military released an audio tape of some of its top Navy pilots who actually saw a UFO. They looked out their window, they got it on radar, this white disc off their right wing moving too quickly and in erratic directions in ways that at least our current understanding of physics says should not be possible. And it turns out we've learned that there's a pattern that shows that UFOs seem to hover around nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons facilities like Air Force bases. It's a pattern that has not gone unnoticed. Well, it's an intriguing topic and one we're going to discuss today with Mike Panicello. Mike is the state director of the Connecticut chapter of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. It's the largest group of persons in the country that track reports of unidentified flying objects, and each of the 50 states has its own chapter. I remember growing up when people used to say they saw a UFO and people kind of ostracized them. Now fast forward and Gallup did a poll, I don't know exactly how long ago, but a couple of years ago, that 16% of the respondents said they absolutely had seen a UFO, and almost 70% said they believe that the government isn't telling us the whole truth. So this is out of the closet, and for a guy like you who runs Connecticut MUFON, that must make you pretty happy. Yeah, this is great. This is fantastic, because a lot of the people in this field of ufology, they've been involved with it all their life, and they were in that group of people who were ostracized and laughed at and considered the crazy people with tinfoil hats, you were never taken seriously, no matter how well you did research, no matter how many documents you could pull with FOIA requests or by interviewing people, no one would ever listen. No one would ever take you seriously. And that was pervasive for so long. And then it all changed in uh, December of 2017 when that New York Times article came out talking about the government's involvement in investigating UFOs. And you no longer were the crazy person with the tinfoil hat. 
I think a lot of people do have that curiosity of what's in our skies and are we alone in the universe, but they were always afraid prior to that to mention anything. You referenced something important, which was the Freedom of Information Act. And that really helped the cause, didn't it? Because you could actually demand, or at least try to demand, to see some of these files. Yeah, it really has. You're not going to get in a FOIA request a smoking gun. Your first FOIA request, 90% of it will probably be redacted if it's something that's in, with the Pentagon. You know, you're not going to find that document that says a UFO has landed on the White House. What you're going to find with these FOIA requests is the little tidbits, the little nuggets, you know, a sentence here, a sentence there. Each time you do a request, you get a little piece of the puzzle until eventually you get the entire puzzle together and you see what the picture is. Charles Holt, who was the deputy base commander in Bentwaters out in England, December of 1980, he saw and his base saw, like some of his men, a UFO. It was over a three-day period. He wrote a report to European Command, and that actually came out in a FOIA request. Now, when you go back, and let's take sort of the granddaddy of them all, which was the Roswell, New Mexico incident, which was uh, July of, I think it was 1947. And, you know, the claim was that a UFO crashed, that the government uh, captured an alien, took them to Area 51, Later, uh, within, I guess, a couple days, they said, no, no, it was a weather balloon and had a news conference showing these supposed remnants of a weather balloon. And people who disagreed with that were called crazy. What have we learned and pieced together and connected the dots on that particular incident? What's your opinion on that based on what you've seen and read uh, as close to this topic as you are? There's some really good researchers out there that have done a lot of firsthand work interviewing the witnesses that were at Roswell. They've interviewed not only the people that were actually there, but they also interviewed their children. And the basic narrative is this. Everyone agrees that something crashed that day, something that the military was very interested in outside of the Roswell airfield. Jesse Marcel went out there. He collected debris. He brought it back to his house. He sold his son. And he said, confirmed what his father has said, that there's something out there that's otherworldly. He talks about like the memory metal that you can take in your hand and crunch it up, and then it pops back to its original shape once you let go of it in your hand. The consensus is after that, that material was first taken down to Texas and later to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was involved with a lot of the reverse engineering during World War II, like with Japanese aircraft. So it would make sense at the time, if you have this object that you don't know what it is, you send it to a place that is responsible for reverse engineering it to figure out what this is. How do you use it? After that, the story, in my opinion, goes a little murky. Some researchers have said that the material stays at Wright-Patterson, meaning it's still there now. Others say it's been moved to Area 51. The other thing that's a little questionable on my end is the number of aliens that were found. The general consensus seems that some kind of form, life form, was found. Some reports say that they were all dead. Some say two were dead, one was alive, and they captured it, so there might be a living alien. There was something that crashed, and it was all kept confidential. Let's talk about you personally. I mean, I remember when I was a kid and the first time I got introduced to UFOs and, you know, spent some time uh, looking up in the sky and wanting to see one, actually, and never did, but uh, I have friends who say they've seen them. What got you personally involved in this topic? Actually, I got involved with ufology by accident. I've always been an aviation fan. I love planes, particularly military planes. And when I was a Younger, when I was in middle school and high school, I used to like to watch the Learning Channel. They had a lot of documentaries on military aircraft. To make it more sensational, they would say, well, well, these aircraft are top secret aircraft because they've been reverse engineered with alien technology. And so that was my first introduction to ufology was with these aircraft because I'm like, well, you know, what did they put in these things from these other otherworldly craft 
And so I started looking into that and I've been hooked ever since. And I became a field investigator because I was looking for sources. I was actually researching the secret space program. And I hit a wall. I, I didn't know where else to go for sources. And I remember on one of the documentaries I watched on the Learning Channel was a documentary with some MUFON experts. And I was like, well, let me try them. Because on the television show, the narrator said, MUFON's the oldest, most respected UFO organization out there. I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I didn't know any better. I was brand new to the field. So I went on the internet and I found the local branch, which was in Connecticut. And I went to a meeting and I asked my questions to some of the members that were there, like, where can I go for sources on the secret space program? And they were just so helpful. They were so accommodating. They gave me all of these leads. And I found myself in awe of how nice they were because I really was expecting what everyone has always said about ufologists, that they're crazy, that they're wearing a tinfoil hat. So when I actually met normal people that are just interested in the field that come from very academic backgrounds, I got hooked. And then I joined and then I figured, well, I'm in for a penny, I'm in for a pound. If something's going to happen in Connecticut, a field investigator would be the one that would see it. They're the ones that investigate the report. So that's why I became a field investigator. And then I became state director after that because there was an opening and no one wanted to fill it. So I filled it. Let's talk about MUFON. All right. So this is the Mutual UFO Network. MUFON seems to have, I guess, five, 10,000 members nationwide, something like that. It's got the Connecticut chapter. Tell us what happens in the Connecticut chapter of MUFON. Do you have meetings? you have how many people? What do they do? Just tell us a little bit about Connecticut MUFON. I joined MUFON in 2012. I became the state director in 2013. When I joined MUFON, Connecticut just broke off and became its own independent chapter. Prior to that, New England MUFON existed, and New England MUFON was just that. It was one chapter comprising all of the states that were New England. We've grown exponentially. We pull around 50 to 60, depending on our speaker. Sometimes we have outings. So in the summer months, we have a group that goes up to Sheffield, Massachusetts. They go to the UFO park that was dedicated for Tom Reed's UFO sighting and abduction. That's really what Connecticut MUFON is on the chapter level and on the social level. On the investigative side, I run a group of seven field investigators. So if you, for example, saw something in your town and you went to the MUFON website or you went to our website, Connecticut MUFON's website, and you reported a sighting, one of my field investigators would go out and investigate that sighting. They'll contact you. They'll do the investigative process. And the third part is to educate the public on ufology how many would you say legitimate ufo sightings are there every year in connecticut and why don't we hear more about these i'll give you a two-part question because i i don't remember the last time a newspaper or a television station or a radio station in connecticut reported seeing a ufo but i'm assuming you get these reports more frequently so if you could address that I would say probably maybe less than 1% are, are truly unknown. We don't know what this is. The caveat, the little asterisk to that is UFO does not necessarily mean aliens. It means it's an unidentified flying object. There might be a number of reasons why it's unidentified. The multitude of military drones that are out there now all were once classified when they were in their development stages and people were reporting them, seeing these strange objects in the sky, only for when they became declassified did you put the sighting report to the where these things were being developed and, and put the two and two together. Connecticut has very active skies. We have a lot of planes traveling across our airspace. So there's many, many planes that either are going into various airports, leaving various airports in the region, or going overseas into uh, Europe. The ones that are the most weird, any kind of object that has an unusual movement, you know you know that most aircraft flies in one direction. If it's a jet or a military jet, a commercial jet, it takes a long time to turn these things. They're talking miles. They don't turn on a dime. They don't turn on 90 degrees. A helicopter stationary can turn very quickly, but you'll hear a helicopter rotor. We have some sightings that come into our state that are of this nature, that they, people will report seeing something in the skies that makes zigzag motions that 
has unusual colors such as bright orange or bright red or, or blue. So those kind of objects do come in to our database, but they're not a lot. Now you would expect, I would think, to see more unidentified flying objects out west where, you know, Area 51 and, you know, all of our top Air Force bases and kind of secret, you know, hidden in the hills type of Air Force bases are located. We just don't have that around Connecticut. Yeah, they see some crazy stuff. I know definitely in Area 51, I, I've known people that have gone out and just, you know, out in Nevada, as long as it's public land, you're fine for a day or two. And they just watch the skies. They've seen some funky things that are up there. You know, like I was saying earlier, objects that zigzag, that have unusual colors. And that's actually where that Bob Lazar, you know, the black mailbox came from, where he, back when he was uh, working, I suppose, at S4. A little background on Bob Lazar is he was a whistleblower, and he claimed that he worked at this Area 51, but like a little subdivision of that, which was like right outside of Area 51, built into a mountain nearby called S4. And at S4 were all of the craft that were supposedly captured by the U.S. government. And one of the things he did when he was employed there is he would take his friends to a spot in the desert when he knew that they were testing these crafts and he'd show them this craft and that area is, is there was a black mailbox there and if you go on out to area 51 now you can see the black the black mailbox it's not the original black mailbox it's been stolen like a hundred times but they always replace it now because of the the lore of it there are people on both sides of the aisle and if he's credible if he's not credible if he's a hoaxer if he's not a hoaxer but he's a perfect example of going out there at night looking at the sky and seeing these craft. And I, like I said, I've known people that have done the same thing and they've seen some very weird stuff. Let me ask you about the academic side of this now. So you've got people like Dr. Michael Masters who will say that alien reports and abduction reports could be the aliens from our future coming back in time to see us now to see how we evolved into our future selves which are more alien shaped that's one side of it and then there's uh, uh avi Loeb at harvard who's saying absolutely there have been ufos here and we need to study this further scientifically what has this done to your cause as the connecticut mufon director is this one of the reasons you think maybe you know, there's more attendance at meetings because people are starting to hear this from people like academics. There's a lot of power behind those three little letters after someone's name, the PhD. All of a sudden you have that on your title and people listen. Prior to 2017, academics wouldn't touch the topic of ufology with a 10 foot pole. Where you're seeing now after 2017 is a lot of tenured professors who are established in their fields now have the time, more importantly, they have the job security and the clout to pursue their interests. They're going into this field and they are changing the narrative because now you're linking their scientific method, their academic discipline to this field and the public is now equating that with how we treat academics. Well, if an academic is involved with this, if the universities are involved with this, if those people with the three little ac three little letters at the end of their name are involved with this, then it's okay. But I still say, even their involvement still has a lot to do with the fact that the government has changed their position on this. The Pentagon has changed their position on this. They are no longer saying there's nothing to this, as they always said prior, but now they're saying there is something to this. When I think about UFOs, and I think about doubters who say, well, that's just absurd, I remind them that we ourselves have taken crafts up to Mars and are flying them around, and why would they think that somebody else from a different planet couldn't be flying something around our planet? Do you look at it the same way? Look at what we've done in, what is it, the 100 years of flight? We went from going a few feet to going to the moon. 
there are older planets than us in the galaxy. We are a young planet. Earth came from other stars that exploded. Other stars were born, lived, and died before Earth was even conceived because we were born of their ashes. So there's no reason to say that other planets were not around, other civilizations were not around at that time. You can't compare our society, our development as a species with something from outside of our solar system. I'm going to go back and tell you a quick story. And this happened when I was news director at a radio station in Western Connecticut, I-95 FM. And on the evening of May 26, 1987, there were very strange, unexplained, unidentified lights in the sky that were in a pattern that looked almost like an apron. Our phone at the radio station rang off the hook from people who had pulled over their cars and found a phone booth because this was days before cell phones and video cameras and that sort of thing. So it was a lot of eyewitness accounts. The police official response to this was that this was uh, an ultralight aircraft out of Stormville Airport in New York State that was flying over western Connecticut, turning its lights on and off. There was a famous eyewitness from Newtown, who I think now has passed on, who was a pilot for 25 years, who saw it and stared at it for a good 10 minutes in his backyard in Newtown and said it's absolute poppycock to say that this was anything like an ultralight. And a lot of other people who saw it said the same thing. Now, do you hear stories like that at all around the state from time to time? In the 80s and 90s, there was the Hudson Valley UFO sightings. They lasted a very long time. It was was very big in the paper at the time. Alan Hynek, he worked for Project Blue Book. He was brought in as a debunker. He was to, to go in and be the scientific voice to show that these UFOs are nothing more than hogwash. They did nothing to them. But he saw so much evidence, he actually changed teams and became a ufologist. And he left Project Blue Book. He, he founded an organization called Center for UFO Studies and spent the rest of his career investigating UFOs. So from like the 1980s to the 1990s, along the western part of the state, from Fairfield County up to Litchfield County, even into parts of Hartford County by like Avon and West Hartford, there was a lot of UFO sightings. To this day, I do not think there's ever been a conclusive answer as to what people were seeing. When you look at the data that you collect on behalf of Connecticut MUFON, is there any part of the state that gets more sightings than another? I have always found, when I look at the data, that the western part of the state gets a lot of the sightings. Fairfield County, up to Litchfield County, along the New York-Connecticut border. We get a lot of sightings from there. The next one we get a lot of sightings of is around the Waterbury, Newington area. We get a lot of sightings in the Manchester area. Where we do not get a lot of sightings from is like the Willimantic area, Wyndham County, Putnam, Rhode Island, Connecticut border. So Groton, Stonington, that part of the state is, is not a lot of sightings. That wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. For the record, Mike Panicello says he has never seen a UFO himself. He did one night spot two triangular shapes in the sky, but his own investigation showed that instead of it being a UFO, it was a plane coming in for a landing at Bradley International Airport. I want to thank Mike for being our guest and participating in today's show. He's the state director of the Connecticut chapter of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. The answer to this week's trivia question, what important industry did 
Plymouth, Connecticut and Plymouth Hollow, Connecticut play host to during the state's early industrial development. Well, that's where Eli Terry and Seth Thomas put Connecticut on the map as the clock-making capital of the United States in the 17 and 1800s. By the way, both those villages were renamed after them, and today we know them as Terryville and Thomaston. We'll hear more about that next week. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe, and please stay healthy. (laughs) 